So Asim and I, we created a one joint presentation which should be about 50 minutes. Uh, that's what we were told. 50 okay. to 60 maybe. Okay, sure. So um, I mean, if you want me to have time you for you, I'll Yeah. So I'm going to aim for, for my, uh, for my part, uh, uh, 30, definitely not more than 35. Uh, okay. so, so when I'm at 25, if you can just give me a five minutes. Yeah, sure. yeah. I might go a bit up because we have uh, quite a lot of Copy. So here's. Uh, okay. Yeah, let me help you. This is this, this, this. It's not reading it. Oh, it says your device is ready to use. Do this. That's weird. Should come here. And, but it says ready to use. <laughs> Look at the, no, don't, don't pull it out. You cannot pull it out. So, okay, so here we, here we are. Um, I guess it's this one. This is the only PowerPoint. The other one is a Word format. So I think this is the. Uh, let's see. Let's open it first. That's not it. That's not it. That's okay. Don't worry. Carry on. When he comes back. All right. Okay. Oh no worries. Uh, right. Okay. This is for the. This, these are the discussion slides. Are these the discussion slides? These are your slides. Yeah, no, the other ones. Do is copy your slides onto. 
Yeah, you have to take the USB I put in. Oh, that I can easily. Oh, I see. That's I. Hi, hi. Just one. Let me. Oh, that's easy. I just take them here. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Um, I'll just take these slides here. Oh, I think this is this is a local. I think so. I think let's see. No, but I think this has to be. You see, this is. Oh, you think this is not your. Yeah, no, but no, but no, but I really, I think it because look, if you click here, which I did before, it says local disk E, and that's why I'm picking E here. So I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I, I think so. So I would, I would take this one and just pick it into that one. And then we need to eject it here. The device is currently in use. Uh, yeah, let me just close this one. That's because this one is open. Uh, yes, I'm just putting my slides in there. Stuff. There you go. All right. Let me quickly. Oh, sorry. Then you're done with the discussion. Yeah, I'm all ready now. So. Uh, uh,
welcome everyone to this uh, Russian and Translation and Development. Uh, very, very important area <coughs> for the developing world. Um, and I might say for the developed world as well. Um, <coughs> we have two presentations in this um, session. So, uh, I will go first. And then followed by Hassan Khaja. Um, so, without further ado, I think I'll let um, the folks speak. Thank you. Okay, so welcome to, to this session. Um, yeah, so we have, Asim and I have prepared a set of slides together, and uh, so it'll be sort of um, merged together, and um, so, but I'm going to do the first part, and then uh, Asim will come in and, and do the second part. So, so here's how we've structured it. So what I'm going to do uh, first is to sort of uh, outline the overall approach that we would like to take to the question of taxation and development in the context of IGC. Uh, and sort of the bottom line of that is that it's going to be related to, it's going to be a micro-based approach and it's going to be a field-based approach uh, to policy research and policy design. Um, I'm obviously going to be saying a lot more about that. And then from that general approach, uh, we'll go into different specific uh, topics and we sort of have four overall topics and I'm going to do two of them and Asim will do the other two. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about tax enforcement and tax policy, and Austin will talk about tax administration and uh, tax morale, taxpayer buy-in, social incentive, that kind of, uh, those kinds of questions. So, um, let me start showing you a graph that will not come as a surprise to you. You've probably seen graphs like this about a thousand times before. So, here we're plotting the tax take, the tax to GDP ratio against GDP per capita. Uh, across many different countries uh, in the world. And as I'm sure that, uh, that you'll all know, those two things are uh, strongly uh, positively correlated. Um, so we have uh, the richest countries in the world have tax takes of 40 to 50 percent, and the poorest countries of the world have tax takes of 10 to 20 percent. And in some uh, big picture uh, way, what we would like to do is to, of course, take those countries in the bottom left corner and put them up, up in the top right corner. That would be the ultimate uh, objective, I guess, of the ITC. Um, that's a very uh, grand goal. So sort of following on that graph, um, I think uh, you can really sort of think of uh, two um, related but, but, but quite different approaches uh, to this question. The kind of cross-country picture that I've just showed you, um, uh, leads very naturally to what we've labeled up here, the big picture macro approach. Uh, that is sort of in the long run over the course of development, what shapes tax capacity and tax take and tax policy and so on. Right, so one specific way of phrasing that, that question is in the way that, that Tim Besley and Torsten Pearson do in their recent handbook chapter on taxation and development. There the question is how does a government go from raising around 10% of GDP to raising around 40 uh, of 50% of GDP. So that's a really, that's an intellectually fascinating question. Uh, unfortunately, it's a question that's really hard to answer. Um, and one of the issues is that a tax take of 40% instead of 10% uh, goes hand in hand with a number of other things, such as GDP per capita, and such as all other aspects of a development pro process. Um, and this implies that it's, it's, it's just going to be very hard for us to um, reach a consensus on, on questions that sort of make sense to everybody and that are credible and believable. Um, so for that reason, we're going to take uh, what I've labeled here, again for the lack of a better term, uh, sort of the nitty-gritty micro-approach, which makes it sound kind of boring and dry and narrow, but it isn't. Um, this is kind of the best term we could come up with, Asim and I. So let's call it that for for the time being. So there the question, there we take a much more sort of local and a much more incremental view on this thing. So we're saying, okay, given that we're looking at some specific countries uh, with weak tax capacity and a number of other context specific issues, what can governments do to incrementally improve different things? Um, and the different things that we're interested in are the four things that I mentioned already on the first slide, um, tax administration, tax enforcement, tax policy, and tax morale. Um, being sort of all the, 
non-pecuniary uh, social factors of, of, of tax enforcement, uh, and, sorry, of tax compliance. Um, so in this talk today, we're going to take the nitty-gritty micro approach, and I'm going to talk a little bit more in general about that approach, and then go into how we would use that approach for each of these uh, four topics. That is, um, I'm going to do the two middle ones that I just described on Asim. I'm going to do the first one on administration, and the last one on tax morale. So, um, to, to spell this out uh, a little bit more, um, so how, we think, how we're thinking about this approach is the nitty-gritty micro approach is that um, it's one where you start from a very specific context and some specific problems of a given country, and you take those seriously, and then you address, uh, then you address, uh, excuse me, then you address uh, concrete problems one at a time, and then based on empirically uh, grounded research, you try and come up with with the signs of typically incremental policy innovations that are suited for that specific context to achieve the, the goals that we have. Okay, and this, this approach uh, lends itself to uh, something that is really at the, at the heart of what the IGC is also about, namely close collaborations between researchers uh, and policymakers. And in fact, this kind of research mostly, most of the time, uh, absolutely requires a close collaboration between policymakers uh, and researchers. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, now, this kind of micro nitty gritty approach probably covers um, a lot of what uh, what work goes on in the IGC within the different uh, areas of the IGC. Um, but arguably, taxation is particularly well suited for this kind of work, this kind of micro work. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that that I've listed that we've listed on these slides. Um, so the first one is that we often have really good uh, data in taxation, in particular tax records offer a really great source of administrative microdata that we can use to address a number of uh, important uh, questions. The second one is that there is um, a ton of variation to be used and learned from when we consider taxation. That is, we have exogenous variation in policy parameters or incentives coming from things like tax reforms, changes in enforcement, um, discontinuities and in incentives created by the specific way in which policies are sometimes designed and so on. Um, so these first two are really key. I'm going to obviously come back to those later. So data and variation um, in, you know, as researchers, is very, very, for, as an empirical researcher, uh, these are really the two key things. It's very hard for us to make any progress in terms of giving uh, sort of believable answers unless we have data and variation. So and that's sort of where um, the collab you know, one important place where the collaboration between policymakers and researchers uh, is, is really important. Um, there are a few other uh, um, um, ways in which I think taxation is ideally suited for this kind of work. One is that the desired outcomes are often measurable. <coughs> Revenue collected is an example of an outcome that we care about and which is measurable. <coughs> um, uh, uh, here, public, public finance also has um, a generally very well-developed theoretical framework that are really helpful both to uh, sort of build empirical strategies that can give reliable answers and, and to go from that evidence to, to policy design. Um, and finally, uh, as we heard in the, in the beginning, there is an increasing and very strong policy interest in this, in this question, and arguably this is an increasing uh, interest due to the fact that many countries are becoming uh, fiscally more independent and self-aligned. So, so this is uh, something important that people care about, and there's um, there's a context here where we can we can do this kind of work. Okay, so with that sort of general introduction, I'm going to um, go to some of the specific topics, and I'm going to do um, two topics. Uh, by the way, do feel free to ask questions along the way if there's something um, specific that you'd like to to raise. Um, Okay, so, and also I speak quickly, and I, it's, it's a pathological thing with me, I, I don't know what to do about it, so do slow me down if, if, if I say something that's just going too fast. Um, okay, tax enforcement, that's the first one, that's, uh, that's one of the important uh, topics in taxation and development for the ITC. So, uh, first of all, what are the key components uh, of a tax enforcement system? Um, I think in general we have uh, sort of uh, four, four main components that I've listed up there. Obviously we have the threat of being audited, 
um, that is the, the, the probability being detected when you uh, are evading. We have the penalties uh, for being caught evading. <coughs> um, then we have the third one, uh, which is third party information reporting. Uh, so the classic and very important example of third party information reporting is of course that um, your employer um, reports your taxable income, uh, your salary, uh, directly to the tax collection agency and therefore they, they know directly about your tax base or your income. Third party information reporting uh, very often but not always come, goes hand in hand with something else which is quite important which is withholding. So again in the example of, of employer third party reporting that almost always comes together with the employer withholding taxes at source and transferring, uh, transferring uh, tax payments to, to, the, to the tax agency. Okay, so that's something we're going to talk about. The, th the fourth one is then related to that, um, um, but a little bit different. So other verifiable information trails. That is, even if you don't have an explicit uh, and automatic system of third-party information reporting, there might be a lot of other third-party information out there that's useful for tax collection agencies. So, for example, they can use uh, credit cards, loan contracts, paper trails, so information trails from business to business transactions and so on to potentially construct true tax bases if they, if they need to. Um, so even though there's no automatic information reporting, there is some information out there that the government could, uh, could potentially obtain. So basically up there, one and two is what you can call sort of traditional enforcement parameters and three and four are what I would call modern uh, enforcement parameters. Okay, so I've written a couple of papers on, on, on these things with, with uh, Klaus Kreiner and Emmanuel Saez, and, and sort of the bottom line of, of, of those papers, um, which is going to be sort of a little bit of a defeatist perspective if we put it in the ITC context, so I'm going to try and deviate from that later, but basically what we're saying there is, as a first approximation, taxation is a, tax enforcement <coughs> is successful if and only if third-party information covers a very large fraction of taxable income. Um, and I do think that is, that is true if by successful we mean a compliance rate of 95% or 97% as we have in, say, Denmark, uh, then that is probably what you, that's the, you need that. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't make more incremental improvements uh, from a different starting point. So, what are we, absent wide coverage in three, you know, of 0.3 and 0.4 together, which is what we have in all of the ITC countries, obviously. What we want to know is first, are there any scope for expanding uh, information, improving information? Um, that's the first one. And, second, and the second one is, if there, are such, if there is scope for expanding third-party information, what would the effects be? And note that here I think you know, there could be very important differences between incremental changes and global changes. That is, even though third-party information uh, reporting works amazingly well in a, in, in a Scandinavian countries or, or, in, the, or, or in the US, um, effects might be very non-linear. That's not necessarily the same as saying that um, an incremental expansion of third-party reporting in a country where there's very little third-party reporting to begin with will do wonders. Um, and I'm going to say something more about specific ways in which you, you know, things might go wrong. And finally, of course, if we can't do anything with information, point 0.3 and point 0.4, then that's when we become interested also in 1 and 2. What can we do with audit? Uh, what can we do with audits uh, in particular? That is, uh, how do we select audits? Um, and uh, how do we design audit procedures and so on? Um, uh, and, yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, so let me show you a graph, and, and here I'm going to... So I mentioned Denmark already, so I'm going to continue with Denmark, which is a country which is basically the polar opposite of all the countries that we have in the IGC, which kind of makes it interesting. I guess and make, there's some information there in, in focusing on this country. Um, and in fact, as I put on the slide there, uh, Denmark is, I think, the current hold of the world record in tax take. Being a Danish native and being aware that we don't have many world records in Denmark, <laughs> I want to point out one of the few that we do have. Um, okay. So what, does, so what does this graph show? Um, so this graph shows, uh, so it plots basically evasion rates against the fraction of, so it's for, this is for personal income taxation, and it plots the evasion rate in personal income taxation against the fraction of your income that is self-reported, that is the fraction of income which is not subject to any third-party information trail. 
Okay, and the red graph here shows the um, the red graph here shows the total evasion rate, and the black dashed one shows <coughs> the evasion rate on your third party reported income. Um, and the difference between those two graphs is, of course, the evasion that you have on your purely self-reported income, and then it shows how that varies through the distribution of the fraction of income self-reported. Okay, and what you can see is that as the fraction of income self-reported goes up, total evasion increases strongly. And at the same time, as the fraction of income self-reported goes up, the evasion rate on third-party uh, on, on third income is essentially always zero. In other words, throughout the distribution of self-reported income shares, each individual is a perfect comply on third-party income and a large evader on self-reported income. So this really kind of shows that you know, it's, it's not necessarily that some individuals are good and others are bad. It's really that everybody is bad when they can, and everybody is good when they, when they can't be bad. <laughs> so, okay, so, so how, how to think about the differences between uh, Denmark and a ID, typical ITC country in the context of this graph? Well, um, there are two key differences. One is that in Denmark, almost all taxpayers down here, almost the whole mass of the distribution is down here. So basically, in Denmark, about 95% of all income is covered by a third-party information trail. And that means that the average compliance rate is extremely high, above 95%. Most IDC countries are going to own the mass is going to be up here. So if we're willing to, I'm not saying we necessarily can't do that, but just for the sake of argument, that means that if we extrapolate from Denmark to an IDC country, the movement from here to here is itself going to reduce the compliance rate from 100% to about 50%, according to this graph. But that actually makes things look better than they probably are, because in some sense you might ask, so, so, so what we have here, you know, bear in mind, the, these are evasion estimates, and there's always some uncertainty about estimates, but uh, leave that aside for now. So what we uh, estimate is that for individuals with only self-reported income, and that would typically be self-employed individuals who are not covered by any information trail in some sense, or not covered by third-party information reporting, the evasion rate is 50%. And sometimes you might say, why is the evasion rate only 50%? I mean, there's no information. Why are they complying so much? Um, and there are two reasons for that that would both be different and worse in, 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 in developing countries. One is that these self-employed are uh, reporting their income in an environment with a very high average compliance. So the social norm is to comply. And if social norms matter, they're more likely to, uh, to report income in this particular context than they would in say, Pakistan, that's one. But the other one is that in Denmark, outside, as I said earlier, outside the explicit third-party information reporting system, there is so much more information. So, for example, a huge part of the transactions done by self-employed individuals in, a, in the Scandinavian countries is done by credit cards. That means that there is an electronic paper trail, which means that you would be running a very ri big risk if you didn't report that income at all. So, when I say that the fraction of income self-reported here is one, that means that the fraction of income that's not subject to explicit third-party reporting is one. It doesn't mean that there's no information. Uh, that information would be, um, there would be much less of that uh, in, in a developing country, which means that, that this last red point here would probably be a lot higher in an ITC country. Okay, so moving from, uh, from Denmark to, um, to sort of a larger set of countries, I, I find this, uh, this graph quite, uh, uh, quite illuminating. So, so what this graph, um, so the idea of this graph is that at the end of the day, the, 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 the single most important component of self-reported income is self-employment income. We observe self-employment across a large set of countries, so the fraction of the workforce that's self-employed provides a nice cross-country proxy for the prevalence of third-party reporting, the prevalence of, of, of not so third-party reporting. And, and indeed, when you, when you plot the tax take against the fraction self-employed, you get a very strong and striking uh, negative relationship where, uh, since I've mentioned Denmark already, let's keep with that, where Denmark is sort of the, uh, the upper, left, uh, upper left corner where you have very few self-employed individuals. Um, <coughs> that is, almost all individuals there are employees in, lo in reasonably large firms, not very small firms, that are part of the third-party reporting system. And then you have the countries that we care about, which are down at this corner here. Um, <coughs> so, and, so again, the question we're going to ask NIDC is, NIDC is not so much how do we take one of those dots down there in the bottom right corner and move them up to the Scandinavian countries, but can we sort of move incrementally along this, this line? Um, although this line is not necessarily a causal one, but um, 
That's a different story. Um, okay. Uh, so um, let me just follow on this graph. Another graph that I that I quite like, which is it's going to tell it tells the same story, but it's just a, you know uh, a little bit better. Let me just go back. One of one of one of the things that you know. Um, in my notes in this graph is that although there is that negative correlation, there is a lot of unexplained variation here. There's a lot of variation in the vertical direction. For a given degree of self-employment, some, uh, some countries have a much, much higher tax take than, than other countries. And I think there are many reasons for all the unexplained variation, obviously, but one of the reasons might be the self-employment is still a relatively um, uh, crude measure of, uh, of the amount of self-reporting um, for two reasons. Um, one is that it doesn't account for all the other uh, information trails that I've talked about. And the other one is that it doesn't uh, account for differences in the effectiveness of third-party reporting for employees. It's not a given that third-party reporting always will work extremely well for employees. And in particular, there are certain types of industries where third-party reporting uh, is not going to be as good. And those are sectors that provide uh, labor-intensive consumer service. So for example, if you're a carpenter in a construction company, where you have third-party reporting, it might not be very effective because it's actually very easy for you to offer some of those services in return for cash outside of the firm, largely independent of the firm in which you're employed. Um, so in general, sectors with lab uh, providing labor-intensive <coughs> consumer services uh, are not going to be, you know, their third-party reporting will not be as binding. This graph builds on that idea by sort of um, considering they have a broader measure of the degree of self-reporting that includes employees in such evasive sectors. And you can see that sort of definitely uh, takes away some of the unexplained variation and sort of makes the observations uh, being closer to, to, the, to the fitted line. OK, so, um, so where does this uh, lead for us? So the policy recommendation that we have in mind here for IGC country X is not to say, well, you should just replicate the Danish information reporting system because that's great. Um, because that's not, that's not likely to lead to anything very useful. There are so many context-specific factors, and I've already uh, talked about many of them, right? So we have, of course, the quality of and capacity of the tax administration. We have self-employment. We have industrial composition more generally. We have firm size and firm complexity, the financial sector. Uh, and we have, uh, the last point here, the scope for evasion and substitution. Um, that I will say uh, a bit more about in, in, in a second. So all of these things are going to be completely different in IGC countries, and they're things that don't change overnight. It's part of the whole development process. So we sort of have to take, take those context-specific things as, as given. So I've given here a couple of, of, of really nice examples of research uh, based on weak capaci tax capacity settings. Um, uh, both of those papers are uh, not based on IGC countries, but let's not uh, hold that against them. Um, so. So one paper is uh, Pomerantz's work on VAT enforcement in Chile, and another one is again Pomerantz, uh, Dina Pomerantz with, with Martin Single and, and uh, is it Paul Carrillo? Or it's, I think it's Paul, yeah. Um, their work on Ecuador, and their work on Ecuador is precisely related to this point that I have about on, on, uh, evasion, uh, on evasion substitution. There the idea is that if you incrementally expand third-party reporting in a country where there is not so much third-party reporting to begin with, then there is huge scope for substituting out of the third-party reported base and into other bases that are not covered. And if you can do that to a very uh, large degree, then third-party uh, reporting might not be incrementally very efficient in that setting. And, and, and so they find, uh, they find um, evidence consistent with that idea in Ecuador. So there, what they specifically look at is that they look at a, an enforcement change where third-party reporting was introduced on firms for their revenue, but not their costs. And what they find is that uh, when there's third-party reporting on revenue, turnover, firms indeed increase reported turnover, but they kind of just increase costs by uh, 96 cents per dollar um, at the same time, so the tax base actually doesn't increase. Um, so you certainly don't want to implement third-party reporting in, in that way. Um, okay, so. So uh, uh, an, another thing that, that Asim and I uh, decided to do was to just sort of, for each of these topics, just sort of um, give you what we see as the sort of the natural local counterpart, because that's kind of important in terms of uh, establishing these collaborations um, that we're talking about. And so for tax enforcement, the obvious uh, key counterpart is the tax collection agency or Federal Board of Revenue or whatever it's called in the specific uh, context. 
Um, and we also think that IT and statistics part, uh, departments can be really important here in terms of really thinking about what data sources are there and what, what information trails can, can, be, uh, can be exploited. Okay, so that's what I'm going to say about uh, tax enforcement. Uh, so now I want to go to, um, to tax policy. Unless you have, do you have questions on enforcement? Uh, might be a natural, no? Yeah? Well, I just made a couple of points. One is that the tax GDP ratio is really a function of the role of the state. Um, it's a function of the role of the state? The role of the state. So, you know, Denmark with a welfare state, you have 40% tax GDP yeah. ratios, whereas most developing countries you don't have welfare states, and the Millennium Development Goal uh, targets are around 18% of GDP. So, in order to meet the Millennium Development Goal minimum. <coughs> Spending requirements you need to be targeted that level. And many developing countries are at that level India, China, most of the African countries. Chile, which you would have done as a weak tax administration country, is actually used by the IMF as an example of a very good tax administration. You, do, you can tell the IMF. Well, it's all relative, I guess. I was comparing, yeah, yeah it's I mean, all relative. Chile is pro probably right. the best tax administration. Latin America, and the Latin American tax administration, to be honest, are better than most of the world. So I would say that really, you need to also think about the relevant instruments for a developing country. And personal income taxes, to be honest, for the reasons you explained, are not the, yeah. uh, the instrument of choice. So what you may want to be looking at is a choice of the information generating tax instruments that affect, say, the corporate income tax through the value added. That's but you're jumping ahead because you're talking about tax policy now. That's my next topic. But sure. uh, that's a very good I'm introduction. Sorry, I think really one needs to be careful in you know, sort of deep tax capacity assessments. You know, we worked on you know half a dozen, well, we worked on half, you know, half around the world, and you know, wouldn't put Chile in that category. It's, it's a housekeeping matter. Um, I was told that <coughs> in the interest of recording. Right. You might want to repeat the question that was asked. It was a common name, but I... I I'm not sure I heard the question, <laughs> but I, so I, that would be... Uh, yeah, that would be hard. Yeah, so... Um, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's tricky in this particular uh, instance, but, uh, but I, will, I will keep that in mind. Sure. Um, there was... You had another one. Yeah, so when we're talking about tax enforcement, to what extent are we only talking about this or actual collection, if you understand, because a big part is that some of these taxes are just not, even when they are known to not be paid, yeah. they yeah. no, I think that's very important. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, so so uh, so when I say third party information in general, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's important to keep in mind uh, the thing that third party information reporting often comes together with, which is income tax withholding. And I think withholding has a separate very important role. It's hard to empirically disentangle the two precisely because they often uh, come together. But I think, I think withholding is, 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 is very important. Uh, I think also for behavioral reasons, so let me sort of inject that point. I think, you know, in economics, we are often very focused on uh, marginal incentives, but I think there is an increasing awareness because of a lot of reasons results, not just in taxation, but elsewhere, that, um, that, that sometimes you get much larger effects from things like uh, defaults, making things automatic, and so on, basically just getting people to do it. And withholding is, is, is a default. It puts like, you know, if you want taxes are paid automatically and you have to do something to evade taxes, whereas if you don't have withholding, it's sort of automatically there is motivation and you have to do something actively to pay your taxes and I think those can be very different very different things um, okay um, so let me move on to to tax policy so um, for tax policy I just want to take uh, one step back and talk a little bit about um, uh, sort of uh, the, the theoretical work the theoretical work that underlies a lot of what we do without going into detail with any of it but as a you know as a first Approximation, there are three papers you need to know in public finance to understand public finance theory, but they're done, basically. Merley 71, Diamond Merley 71, and Atkins Tax 76. So much of what we do goes back to these three papers. Each of them associated with, with, with one particular result. Uh, Merley 71 is about um, 
the optimal income tax schedule and how that relates to preferences for, uh, for equity versus uh, efficiency costs. Um, Thalman and Murley's 1971, which I'm going to come back to in a few minutes, is really about the, what is called the production efficiency theorem, which tells us that we should not use any tax instruments that create production inefficiencies. And Atkinson's and Stigley's 76 is about uh, the use or not of differentiated commodity taxation. So these three papers, um, I mean, there's a lot of good work that comes after this, uh, but, but in some sense it goes back to some fundamental insights that are in these, these papers. And so these three papers and all the literature that build on it uh, has sort of amounted to uh, a, a recommendation that goes something, something like this, although it's not all of it, it's not completely uncontroversial, but the way it would often be presented is that progressive income taxes are good, that's a good instrument to use if you want to redistribute income, so you should use that. And the VAT is, is, is a good instrument, so these, these are the good instruments. And then there are some bad instruments, and those are differentiated consumption taxes, except for correcting externalities. But differentiated consumption taxes, for example, higher taxes on luxury goods than on necessities to redistribute income, bad thing. Capital taxes, this one I think is a lot more controversial, but still you'll see it in a lot of papers. Capital taxes are bad. And what most people would say is the taxes on turnover, trade, and intermediate goods um, are bad. Okay, so, so that's kind of where the literature is. And in some sense, we could be done right there that we have our recommendations for the ITC countries, uh, except that those results are based uh, on a couple of uh, assumptions. One is perfect tax enforcement. That is, and what does that mean? That means zero tax evasion at zero administrative cost. Mm -hmm. I don't think that captures uh, the situation in IDC countries. And the other one is that uh, the government, the policymakers have just a very flexible and full set of tax instruments that they can use um, pretty much perfectly. So, sorry. Yeah. You don't talk about the municipal and local taxes or levies, like uh, anything you pay for when you are a shopkeeper, you pay some kind of municipal people to clean up uh, those papers are not, I mean, well, uh, uh, is it covered by these papers? I think the Diamond Murley's production efficiency theory might have something to say about it, but yeah, no, it's, these three papers are sort of about, it's, it's about income taxation, uh, then the two next ones are in some sense about tax and commodities, so I think some, somewhere, but these, this is a fairly high abstraction level, these, these papers, so for that I think you would have to go to sort of more specific uh, papers, uh, so that's why something has happened since these three papers in terms of maybe making it more concrete um, and looking at specific contexts. Okay, so so I think um, one of the key things uh, that we want to do when we think about uh, uh, tax policy, so by the way, I think I'm going to, so the five minutes was based on the 30 minutes, right? So I, since we have so much slack, I might you know go more for the 35 minute uh, line that we had talked about. Um, so, so, is, so one thing that I think is important is that we want to go from tax rates to tax instruments when we're, when we're talking about tax policy in IDC countries. So there's been just so much academic work, in fact, much, much of the academic, most of the academic work in this area has really studied optimal tax rates, taking a, as given the instruments that we're interested in. And the key instrument that people have mostly been interested in is the personal income tax. So this work is really great, I've, you know, uh, and it's interesting, and I been in that area myself, I still am in that area uh, some of the time myself, but it's just not first order, I think, for thinking about developing countries because um, personal income taxes are, are, are hard to implement and enforce there, so currently it's not, uh, it's not a, a very central instrument um, in, in developing countries. Um, so I think in settings with weak tax capacity, uh, the choice of policy instruments become, become key. Um, so rather than choosing tax rates for a given instrument, we're choosing between different instruments. And so the question there is, which instruments in the specific context represent the best trade-off between all the standard stuff, efficient, the sort of efficiency and equity concerns on the one hand, and compliance administration concerns uh, on the other hand. And I'm going to talk about one example um, uh, uh, of uh, an IGC project on on this topic, and that's the, pace, uh, the paper that I've done with, with, uh, with a number of co-authors, Michael Best, and Brockmeyer, Johannes Spinnerwein, and Masar Wasim. So, uh, but I'm not going to talk about it yet, I'm going to talk about it in a few slides. Um, right, so, so what I want to, before talking about that, I just want to go take a step back and, and, and look at some graphs again. So this is uh, to just sort of illustrate how important it is to think about instruments and tax structure in, in, in these settings. So, 
So this is the graph I showed you in the beginning, positive relationship between tax take and GDP per capita. So we know that. But what I think is really useful is to split. So the thing is, the tax take is going on, but a lot is happening to tax structure along this line. So I think what is quite illuminating is to uh, split the tax take uh, into what you can call uh, traditional taxes and what you can call modern taxes and look at the cross-country correlations for each of those separately. So that's what I'm doing here. So what I call modern taxes here in this panel, that's essentially personal income tax and VAT. Traditional taxes, those are all the rest. So that's property taxes, inheritance taxes, excises, sales taxes, custom duties, and so on. And what you can see is that all of the positive correlations that we know so well from, from the other graph is driven by the modern taxes. Um, whereas the other one features a completely flat relationship or even a weak sort of negative, a negative relationship. So, so what's really happening over the course of development is that, um, that, that countries are changing the instruments they use and they're introducing new instruments. Another way of looking at that, instead of look at, uh, looking at the cross-country uh, relationships, we can look at that by considering the current high-income countries and how they evolved historically. Okay, so here I've shown you four countries, uh, the United States, Germany, France, and Denmark. Um, We've created, so this is again joint work with, with Klaus Kreiner and Emmanuel Saez. We've created historical uh, series like this for a large set of countries, and the pattern is always the same, and it's exactly what I have here. That is, the tax take increases over time. It has sort of an S-shaped form. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of flat, and then it expands, and then it plateaus again. So you have that kind of S-shape. And then the, ch the tax structure changes drastically over time. So basically, all of the ex expansion is driven by the introduction of modern taxes, that is the personal income tax, corporate income tax to some extent, and the, and the VAT. So, uh, so the countries, so the current advanced countries, when we go back to the early 20th century or the late 19th century, look pretty much like today's developing countries, today's ITC countries, but now they look completely different. The transition from one to the other took almost a century. Um, so I think that sort of shows uh, quite clearly that it would be kind of a futile policy recommendation for us to say, well, take an IDC countries and then recommend that they do this, which is what the current uh, high-income countries are doing, because there are reasons why it took time. There is, there is a process that goes into this, and there are a lot of factors to it. I'm not saying that it necessarily has to take 100 years, but, um, but we sort of have to be aware that there is, that there is you know, these things take time. Henry? Yeah. Can I have a question? Oh, hi, Meta. Uh, Long time no see. Does this include social insurance taxes? So, social security taxes are part of modern taxes. So, some of this is also just demographic. Yes, that, that would be part of it. That would be part of it. That's true. Great. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. The joint PC on France is uh, shows that after you introduce the modern taxes, the graph goes up. But at the same time, the income is also going up by that amount. Right? So there is a correlation between income and... and yeah, GDP, GDP per capita is increasing over, over, over the course of development, right? So that's precisely, you know, these countries in the early, uh, early 20th centuries, I think, had GDP per capita that are not too dissimilar from the current uh, sort of uh, low, income per ca low GDP per capita countries. So that's why the picture you're seeing here is closely related to the cross-country picture that, you're, that you saw before we were comparing uh, different countries today. Sorry, yeah. just to follow up on that question, I mean, you understand the extent to which lack of state capacity hampers the public goods. It would be really nice to just separate, I think, the part that's reinsurance, like, I mean, or just social insurance versus uh, other public goods, right? Is right. there a version of that that exists somewhere? Like, what would that look like? Would it look nearly as deep? Because I would say bulk of this is kind of publicly provided out there and, and, and social security. Um, well, there are two things. I mean, I think there's, there's the expended... So, th as I understood Netta's question, she was asking about Social Security taxes. Are they part of it? And Social Security taxes, that's a big deal for the U.S., for example. That's, a, that's an important tax. In the demo, we don't have a Social Security tax. We just have an income tax. So, it's, the thing is, when you look across countries, you see the same qualitative pattern, even though these things are structured differently. But then I think you, you, you also asked about sort of, you know... Um, I guess, I guess what you're saying is show graphs like this, but for the expenditure side, and let's see uh, the, how that composition of expenditures have, have changed over time. But another way so. to think about that is how much of the spending is required because of entitlement as opposed to how much is the state. Yeah. 
Fine, fair enough. Yeah, that would be interesting. Okay, no, that's a good, that's a good, those are good, uh, good points, good suggestions. Okay, so let me try and, and wrap up by talking about this, this, the last paper that I, that I just want to talk about, which is the recent paper I did with uh, of co-authors that I mentioned before. So, so there we go back to this Diamond Murley's uh, result about production efficiency, right? So the idea is there, do not use uh, uh, tax instruments that are production inefficient. One specific thing, that rules out many things. It rules out trade taxes, it rules out many different things. One of the things it rules out are turnover taxes. And um, the reason why they rule out turnover taxes is that turnover taxes, um, well, part of turnover will be sales to other firms. So part of turnover will reflect intermediate goods being sold to other firms. So when you tax turnover, you're taxing intermediate goods. And when you're taxing intermediate goods, you're distorting the input mix. And furthermore, a turnover tax, because a turnover tax happens at every stage of production, it means that the intermediate good get, gets hit every time, so the tax cascades. So not only is it, does it distort the input mix, but it distorts the input mix more and more and more further downstream in the production chain. It can become very distortionary. So normally we would say, do not use turnover taxes. But, there is a but, you know, maybe a turnover tax, which is a really, really broad base, is harder to evade than a profit, than a profit tax. Okay, and, and it's precisely this idea that the turnover tax is harder to evade that has motivated a uh, policy that we see in, in numerous, almost all developing countries uh, have this, um, this, this particular uh, policy, which is a, call, it's a minimum tax scheme whereby you tax firms either on profits or on turnover with a much lower tax rate applying to turnover because it's a much bigger base, depending on which tax liability is larger. Um, so basically, what this implies in practice is that firms that are reporting very low profit rates and therefore would have a very low profit tax liability, they are the turnover tax binds and these that, they, they that go into the turnover <coughs> tax regime. Um, motivated by the fact that compliance would be better there, even though it's production, um, uh, production uh, inefficient. So that's precisely... So, so if I can just, because I'm, 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 I'm running out of time here. So, so just to sort of give you the, 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 the bottom line of, of what we do in this paper is that we use uh, um, uh, administrative tax data and some exogenous variation in tax rates to estimate that turnover taxes reduce evasion by up to 60 to 70 percent of corporate income. So there's, in other words, switching from a profit tax to a turnover tax, uh, we estimate reduce evasion by 60 to 70 percent. We put that into a little uh, civil model and, 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 and show that these compliance gains can outweigh the loss of production efficiency uh, that you suffer from using this instrument. Um, and so the minimum tax scheme might actually be uh, a good policy in, uh, in, such a, in, in a setting like Pakistan, which is a weak tax capacity setting. Mostly on uh, indirect taxes, not direct taxes. Indirect taxes will not be this you mean personal income tax? No, this, these are these are these are firms. First of all, the tax will not be based on turnover tax. It will be based on the profits of the company. The the it will be based on the profits unless that profit rate gets too is too low, in which case the the minimum tax scheme will bind. You put in thresholds on that. Yes, there is a threshold. So precisely what happens is this. So uh, so basically what this what the, what the system implies is that if your profits so are there there's some, uh, so let me just go, not go into too much detail here, but there are uh, some corporations in Pakistan face a higher tax rate than other corporations. So let's just foc on, focus on um, what is relevant for most corporations, which is what are called the high rate firms here, the high rate kink. Um, so, so the corporations that ha face a high profit tax rate, for them, if their reported profit rate falls below a profit rate of exactly 1.43%, <coughs> then their profit tax liability becomes so low that they get taxed on their turnover. And that turnover tax rate is only half a percent. The profit tax rate is 35 percent, but it's half percent on a much broader base. So as firms cross this point here, they switch from a profit tax to a turnover tax. Um, and so that creates a discontinuity in incentives because the tax base is switching completely at this, at this threshold. 65 percent of the tax the corporate tax so don't pay any tax at all. What's that? They don't pay, about 70% don't pay anything at all. So neither the minimum tax nor the corporate tax. The general of the... Uh, so if, yeah, the, there, are, there are lots of firms outside of the tax net, but these are the firms that are, in fact, filing taxes and are paying taxes. 
Um, they're, 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 filing, they're, they're filing positive profits. It's on their return, so they're paying taxes. Um, okay, so what you see, so what is, what is really important to see here is that there is massive bunching in these distributions. This is the distribution of profit rates around these thresholds, and there's massive, excess mass of firms right around the threshold. Um, and, uh, and so what that means, to cut a long story short, is that firms are responding to the incentives created by this minimum tax scheme. They're responding to the incentive created by the switch between instruments. And specifically, and that's kind of what a lot of the paper is about, and now I'm really running out of time, so let me just, let me just sort of make a claim without explaining it too much. What we show in the paper is that the way in which incentives are changing when you, when you move across this threshold, if you, were, if you were honest, if you were a perfect complier, your real production incentives would change by very, very little. It would be a minuscule change in your real production incentive. Incentives. What changes is that you're taxed on a different base, and that will give a big a, a evasion or avoidance incentive if those bases are associated with different evasion opportunities. In other words, in some sense, this bunching that we're seeing here represents prima facie evidence of an evasion response to a switch between two bases. It's almost impossible to reconcile this with real responses, and that's kind of what underlies our our. Um, our strategy, but what is maybe more important is just to summarize what is it that we are exploiting here that is important for IGC research. We're exploiting two things. One is that we have interesting data, namely ta the tax returns, the filed tax returns of all corporations uh, in Pakistan. And another one is that we have exogenous variation in tax incentives because of this particular policy being designed in a way that creates this discontinuity um, in incentives. Okay, so. Uh, the so the incentive could also be in the form of reducing the rate. And what we have seen in case of our experience is this, that if we have not increased the rate, the tax collection has gone up. And if we have reduced the rate, the tax collection has gone up even more. So I think that's a big incentive given to the taxpayer because then there is a confidence. Mm -hmm. and this, is a, this is our experience. Uh, so uh, yeah, so that, that's an, that's so that's another question. Then the one I'm addressing here is like, how do you set rates optimal, optimally for a given instrument? And what you're saying is that you, in your experience, you are beyond the laugh point in in Pakistan. That's that's possible. I don't have anything to say about that. What what I can say is that in 2000, this minimum tax scheme was abolished in 2008 in Pakistan, and that led to very big revenue losses. So having this turnover tax uh, is that's creating a lot of revenue. So. Um, Okay, so let me just conclude by saying uh, this is sort of one of those instances where the conclusion of this paper is in some sense to say that policymakers are doing something that is very right. Uh, so it's not always that we want to sort of, um, uh, as academics, come and say that you know, what policymakers are doing is all wrong and we have, we have better ideas and better solutions. Sometimes we confirm that the things that are already practiced are actually good things. I think this is still useful to confirm. Plus, of course, that kind of work can inform potentially sort of more incremental modifications of, of the given policy. One way would be to go in the direction you just said and thinking about what are then the optimal rates in this system and, and, and are they uh, on the wrong or the right side of the laffer, the laffer curve. Okay, I've, I've gone over time, so uh, I think, go ahead. Thanks, Henrik. Uh, sorry, sorry, so Henrik uh, talks very quickly. I also talk very quickly, but I have a knowing habit that I move around a lot as well. So <laughs> unfortunately, there's a clicker and this keyboard isn't wireless. So uh, I'll, I'll try to move around. Uh, I'll try to contain myself, but I know it's going to be hard. So I'll be moving around and coming back to the uh, um, to, to the screen. So I come from taxation in very different perspectives. My perspective is more as a development economist. I'm pretty much a mainstream development economist, not a public finance guy. And so a lot of the views in development that I take in taxation are kind of stemming from that. And I think, as, as Henrik and I were discussing, it's sort of very complementary. So it's kind of this, this, I think this presentation came, came together nicely in the sense that the, 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 the focus I have much more is, is thinking about these two aspects, which is the administration, the tax administration, something Henrik has talked about, about as well, uh, but, but really taking a more HR perspective in the way you would think of a civil service reform. Taxation is no different from that. Uh, but also then thinking a bit about, and I think this is something we were alluding to earlier, another comment, and Karthik's comment, uh, or I think Spanish. Oh, there it is. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All brown guys. Uh, so, which was the, the, the idea that basically there is kind of this reciprocal relationship between the taxpayer and tax collector, and often your ability to raise taxes is really contingent on what you're spending the taxes on. And, and so, I'll talk a bit about this idea of this, this the stuff that Henrik alluded to, where there's lots of variation left even after you explain the, the tax code and what is that, could that be taxpayer morale? Uh, and so, so I'll talk a bit about that. What I also thought I'd do is um, 
Uh, time is very limited, and we'd love to hear more of the, 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 both the discussion, but also the audience's comments as well. Um, so I'm going to focus mostly on one, because I want to illustrate a particular type of engagement as well, and I think this is more reflective of how IGC is, is trying to promote work. Um, so I'll flesh out um, uh, it, it, one engagement in, in, in more detail, which is a particular joint project with a tax department on, on how this kind of nitty-gritty micro-approach uh, could work and, and generate, hopefully, uh, some payoffs. So I just want to make three, so often I, I was told that if you make presentations, make sure you give two or three things that people remember and then you can go to sleep afterwards. So, so, so here are the three key points I want you to keep in mind when you're thinking of tax administration or even, even taxpayer morale. First, people matter. That's pretty obvious. Uh, when I say people matter, I, I mean it in a very particular way, which I'll, which, I'll, which I'll talk about in a second, in a way that I think um, economists will, will think of people matter. We don't, we don't tend to be bleeding heart humanists, and so when we say people matter, we probably mean something else. Uh, but what I mean people matter is both the tax staff and your citizens really matter in terms of achieving whatever tax compliance or, or, or tax collection success you'd like to. Uh, the second point which we make, and this is now if you thought the economist and me had vanished, here's the economist back, people typically act in their self-interest. Okay? So these are two abiding principles. We come in, uh, uh, and when you think of taxation, you keep the same principles in mind. So people generally act, and I, you know, I don't want to say there is an altruism. Of course there is, right? Uh, but the point is that these are fundamental driving forces. And what this is leading to is a whole theory in economics called agency theory, right? And the whole field in economics which talks about, well, if people act in their self-interest and people really matter, in other words, whenever you make a policy, it interacts with how people would respond to that policy. Well, then you have to do something called incentive compatibility. And this is, again, a fancy word of saying, uh, recognize that people care about their self-interest. Okay? It shouldn't be an unfortunate fact about the world. It should be a reality about the world that you confront with, with your policies, so that when you make policy, you, in fact, not just are, are sort of apologetic about this, this deep desire that people have to improve their own lifestyles, uh, but you can actually exploit it in a good way. You can design your policy so it takes advantage of the fact that people behave uh, in this particular way. I, I would argue most religions are based on incentive compatibility as well, and so it's not that this is a new concept. Uh, we've been going on this for a while. So, so these are the three insights that as we talk about tax administration or tax reform, particularly on the personnel side, but even on the citizen side, I want to keep coming back conceptually to these three principles, which will, which will guide us. Um, yeah, yes, please. If you can see the point one and point two, they contradict each other. And uh, what you're saying essentially is this, that the staff and citizens matter, and also their self-interest matters. I don't think they contradict each other. If you give me a few slides, I'll tell you why. Uh, what people matter to is, so let me give you a comment. I, I remember once getting the comment, I was presenting some of this work, actually in Pakistan. Uh, I, I won't name who said this, but it was a colleague of yours. Uh, um, one of the comments was, um, you know, you're doing all this work, but ultimately the people that you're working with aren't the right people. And it's a very, it's, a, it's an important comment. It's a comment which says, this is a big comment in civil service, which is we select people in civil service, sometimes who might have particular preferences. Maybe they're great preferences, maybe not so great preferences. And if you're working with these set of people, you'll never change the system because the people aren't the right. That's the sense in which people say people matter. Right? That the individuals that are in organizations really make a difference. And most of the research we're showing, it's not, it's not surprising. Most of the research we saw, whether it's CEO identity or individual policymaker uh, uh, identity, these things really matter. So that's the first one. Right? To say, when you, whenever you try and explain an institution's success, it's very hard to separate it out from the individual's behavior in that institution. As much as we'd like to think that institutional rules and norms kind of contain the individual, they really don't. So that was just the first one. The second point, is conditional on the fact that you recognize people will really make a difference, then you have to recognize what motivates people. How do you get those people to act in a way that is in concordance with your desires as the person who's running the department? Or as we would say in economics, a social plan. How do you get society to work in a way that it produces a collective good when everyone is individually working in their own selfish interest? Is that even possible? Or is that a contradiction in terms? And I think a lot of the insights in economic theory are saying, you may not get the first, first best in the sense of what we really like, does that mean altruism and social giving and a whole bunch of stuff, but you can actually get what we call a second best or a constrained efficient, which is the best you can do given what you have. And a lot of the, what Tenric is talking about in terms of incremental reform is often starting from that. That's not to say that changing people's mindset isn't important. It is. Selection is a huge difference. 
Uh, and it's something we're not discussing right now, um, but I, I'm happy to talk about it in, in the discussion. But, but, but thanks for the comment. I hope it helped clarify a bit of what I was trying to say over here. Okay, look, this is, this is a non-trivial issue. There's a huge issue in civil service reform, and I, by any means, a lot of you are experts in this area, I do not want to diminish how hard this is. This is an extremely, extremely hard one, right? Uh, and, and one of the things in civil service reform issue is you can say, well, why is it so hard? I, I just gave you some reasons. Uh, I'll come to it in a second. But I first just want to characterize what civil service remuneration typically looks like. Typically, it's low unless you're Singapore. Uh, but for most places, it's low in an absolute sense. Um, second, it's typically at least untied to performance in an explicit way. It might be implicitly tied to uh, performance, but explicitly is very good. I want to jump in quickly on this low business, right? I think it's low only for the 5% of civil servants who are yes, at the top yes, end of the distribution. Yes, I agree. The like, vast majority of civil servants are paid much more than the market rate in most wealthy countries. Right? Not so true with our tax cuts. But the lack of true compression, the lack of wage compression is, I think, a, agree. probably a bigger issue than low pay. Anyway, so I agree. there's too many agree. people walk away thinking increasing governments have That's a good point. That's a good point. So we just finished an RCP where we doubled pay in Indonesia for no impact. So. And no impact. I agree. I agree. I'm not at all arguing, as you well know my own work, that flat increases in pay is going to be anything. But there is a subsistence. But, but I could walk away with that feeling. So. I agree. Fair enough. Uh, um, the third thing is um, they're often limited career advancement opportunities. So they are, uh, but these organizations don't tend to have the same career advancement as you would in a large uh, firm. Uh, and so that's something to think about. However, number four, they are actually substantial non pecuniary benefits. Now, some of these could be fairly benign, which is their legal benefits that arise from your job. They're allowed, they're permissible benefits. Uh, uh, for instance, you could get domestic help, you could get your car, uh, gasoline paid for, things like that. Um, you could imagine that there's social status and influence as well, which are all permissible. Um, and then they're not so benign ones, uh, which is rents and corruption. Okay. So I'm not saying that there isn't an equalization of market wages, but I'm just saying. Yes. I'll talk about that. That's a great. I'm going to come to exactly that. That's exactly right. That there is, uh, there isn't career advancement in the sense of the normal vertical progression, but there's lots of horizontal. They all know the good jobs are the I'll talk about a scheme which we're doing in Pakistan, which is exactly testing that in in about ten slides. Um, okay. Um, so so Karthik is here. If Karthik's on Earth. I have to give one super depressing graph. Uh, but since I'm in a taxation group, I don't want to give it for taxation. I'm going to give it for education. Um, so this is, um, you know, sometimes you get data graphs which really you, you look at them and you sort of, for the next week, you're kind of depressed. Uh, this is one of those graphs. I wanted to share some depression with you guys. But it's in education, so maybe you can feel good because we are mostly tax people there. So this is how, this is simply plotting wage against performance. A very, very crude measure, so I don't want to debate this. Uh, but, you know, a teacher's qualification or score or ability against the wage they get paid. This is data from Pakistan work that I do there. Um, this is private schools. This is what you'd expect. If you're like a company CEO or entrepreneur, you'd expect that you'd be paying your better people more. It kind of makes sense. Um, the depressing part is not this graph. The depressing part is the equivalent of this graph in the public sector, which not only is not flat, it's actually downward slope. Now, this is not the case that the public sector is pernicious and wants to, to, to discourage good performance. It's that in the public sector, uh, at least in this is teachers, um, there is no explicit wage being tied to performance, although now some of the states in, in Pakistan, Karthik has some really nice work in Andhra Pradesh on this, which is what happens when you take public school teachers and you give them a contract like the Blue Line. And what are they capable of doing? And the answer is lots of really cool stuff. Uh, so it's quite powerful. The reason this is downward sloping is really because wages are high to seniority. And now you might ask, why do more senior people become worse? Well, it's not just that they're worse, but kind of, you know, this is, I discovered this after I got tenure, which is intellectually lazy or whatever. So as you can see, I'm intellectually lazy. Uh, it's coffee pointed out in some of my facts. Although he has tenure now, so I'm hoping he'll get intellectually lazy soon enough as well. Um, okay. But the point being made over here is very simple, which is, this is not surprising. This is not picking on one country, one sector. If you, if you plot these graphs in lots of places, you'll see something fairly similar. Uh, okay. 
Now the question becomes then, why is it so hard? This is not rocket science. Of course people in the public sector love this. Right? Why is it hard? Now this is again a whole agenda, and so I just gave a couple of different things. Um, often, and this is things to be honest, based on a, a project where we tried to do this, and these were the kind of common comments we get in response. Um, you know, th there is this, so Weber did lots of damage. Uh, a lot of philosophers can do lots of damage. Uh, uh, Weber's damage was this notion of the socially minded bureaucrat. This notion that basically all you needed to get these good, well-meaning people, and there was this warm glow when you become a bureaucrat. And for my bureaucratic friends, I, not to say that I'm sure you get a warm glow, but, but warm glow doesn't quite necessarily get your kids into LSE. Um, right, so, so there's a challenge in this idea that basically all you need to do with bureaucrats was pay them a flat wage which was reasonable and nothing special, and just the desire to serve the citizens will have them select into these, these good individuals. You don't need incentives. Um, one way of saying is they're intrinsically motivated. They're people who love the fact that they're helping, uh, helping others. And I have met some people like this in my life, and um, puzzled by them usually, but I appreciate it. But I haven't met enough of them in enough places to think that this is going to be a theory of how civil services can work, or, or frankly, any service can work. Uh, but there is a strong idea uh, of this. And by the way, there's, a, there's, a, there's another aspect of this idea which is very interesting, which is kind of a corollary of this idea, which is not only do you get these well-meaning, socially altruistic people, but if you pay them well, or if you reward them, somehow they'll get frightened away. This lure of money will basically, or what you're really saying is, the greedy types like Mushrik will show up uh, and kind of crowd out these well-meaning types. You, you had a doubt at me in the previous uh, reciprocal relationships. Uh, so, so there's that per, kind of perversity that somehow paying is a bad thing. And I've actually heard various forms of this as well. Uh, now, the other, I mean, those could be sort of uh, ideological reasons, but they're actually real practical reasons. Um, as all of you who are civil servants know, Judging performance is really hard when the performance metrics are sometimes unclear. And I would argue sometimes not even identified. If you talk to the education secretary and ask them, what is your goals? He or she may say enrollment. But then you ask them a week later, they might say learning quality. You ask them another month later, they might say employability. And these are real tough questions. Not that they're wrong. It's just that these are different takes. So it's hard when you think about what objectives you want to achieve. And if you don't know what objectives you're trying to achieve, it's really difficult to tie performance. And if you're a firm, it's pretty clear. You want to make money. Well, maybe your CSR stuff, and you want to make BP, you want to make money, and I'll kind of be burnt out by the protesters, so you have a bit of CSR. But, but at the end of the day, it's pretty clear. A lot of the desired outcomes in public service are hard to measure, hard to define, hard to quantify, and that's going to raise challenges in any performance scheme. And secondly, even if you can measure these things, there might be multiple types of metrics. Right? It's not just one thing. Right? And public servants know this. You're doing like a thousand jobs. If you're, if you're um, heading a, a department uh, or, or a district commissioner or something, you have a gazillion different things you're dealing with. Uh, right? uh, the last one, by the way, I, I want to say, I think is a myth, um, is you don't have enough money. I actually don't think that's true. I think there's a lot of merit to the first. The money one, it turns out that most incentives are designed well, you only pay when they deliver. And if you only pay when they deliver, it doesn't effectively cost you anything. Right? And I'll talk, I'll, I'll like, all of this I'm saying, I'm going to give you some kind of evidence to, to support this. Okay? So what about taxation? Um, taxation actually is nice in lots of ways. And one way it's nice, and Henrik alluded to these a lot as well, is it's actually a bit easier. Some of these challenges are a bit more easy. You know, it's clear when you ask a tax official what your objective is, the first response they'll give uh, and there's several tax officials over there, will be unmandated to collect revenue. Now, when you push them more, actually even when you don't push them, they'll immediately also often say, but it has to be fair. But I want to make sure that it's not like putting a gun on someone's head and saying pay me. Right? Um, I, I have to collect money in a sense that the political costs or the citizen is not burning tires on the street. You can't do that. Anytime you try to raise a tax and that happens, you think twice. So, so it's revenue conditional on not disrupting the politics too much. And also, it's very easy to compare benefits and costs, because the return is money. So when you do an ROI calculation, try and quantify, ask Carl if they can give you a six hour lecture on this. Uh, try and quantify the returns to a higher qualification, the higher education quality. What are the economic returns to that? Non-trivial question. We have a whole. 
people have got Nobel Prizes for things like these, right? So these are non-trivial questions. But in taxation is a bit easy. Uh, but having said that, the only way this is possible, and I want to acknowledge uh, all of the policymakers sitting over here, um, the DG of taxation is here, uh, he's a counterpart of some of the projects that he worked on, is this is simply not possible unless the policymaker is willing to do this. It just never happens. No matter what ideas we can come up with, no matter how convincing we can be, no matter what data we show, unless the policymaker is willing to innovate and take a joint stance with us, it'll never happen. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of acknowledge that all of the work that we're doing is only possible because there are individuals uh, in the policymaking side who have had the, the, the willingness and, and foresight to, to, to work. Um, well, foresight, you might, you might hold reservation of whether it was foresight, but at least willingness. Um, so let me describe one very specific project which gives an illustration of, of how this can work. So this is an IGC uh, supported project. Um, Adnan is sitting over here. He's a, he's a uh, co-author in this. Adnan is a unique person because I guess Adnan, you would say you were a policymaker and now you're a researcher or you say you're both? Or depending on the time of the day, both. Um, <laughs> both. <laughs> Appropriate response. Uh, um, so uh, this is Adnan and Ben at MIT um, and it's with the Excise and Taxation Department in Pakistan. Uh, it's funding by several people, but I wanted to also highlight there's a lot of funding by the government itself. In fact, the majority of funding needed for a project like this, which is going to be in the performance phase, by the government. They pay incentive payments. Those are the largest part of what you do over here. Um, we're focusing on property tax primarily because it was an easier tax. We talked about incremental reform in the way Henrik mentioned. It's an easier tax to start off with, and it's easy to verify compliance. You can actually, you know what the true tax liability is, and theory is measurable. Income is really what the measure. You can actually technically, uh, it's a simple formula. You can go to property and you know exactly kind of how much tax is, is due. Although, I guess Oyabola and I were discussing this last week that it, even there it's slightly non-trivial. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's a lot better than other taxes. Okay. Um, so another kind of lesson uh, that uh, uh, that Henrik started off with is, you know, if you if you went the route of saying, okay, what do developed countries do? How do developed countries pay their tax officials? The answer would be flat wages. No one does incentive pay. Right? So if you follow that model, you'd say, this is a really stupid <coughs> idea. Why are you doing this? Right? Um, why are you paying these guys incentive pay when no one does it in the developed country? In fact, um, for those of you who are, who are connoisseurs of history, if you remember the French Revolution, one of the first guys who were guillotined were actually tax collectors. It wasn't a random correlation. You actually went after these guys because you didn't like them. Uh, so a lot of countries moved away from tax collection because it led to overtaxation. A lot of developed countries, it led to extortion. Right? It's called tax farming. This was not, you don't want to, uh, this is actually how the British ruled India for a long time, for subcontinent, which is you created vassals who could do whatever they want as long as you gave you money, right? So it made them extort. Um, but the question is, and again, coming back to what Henrik said earlier, maybe this makes sense if you have all these other things. If you have low corruption, if you have good data systems, if you have third party data verification, then you don't need these incentives. You need flat systems. But what would happen if you thought about a designing from scratch, if you would? And so what should we do? Can we just say, well, this is a silly thing to do because no developed country really does this anymore? Um, I would argue we use the approach. Uh, uh, this kind of more um, um, sort of policy design uh, type approach. Um, and to do this approach, you need something, it's, it's, it's very painful, it's very long, uh, but I'm hoping it's rewarding. Um, and let me give you just the key elements of this approach. So I can talk a lot about this. Um, first of all, you have to have a joint design. You have to sit with your colleagues, you being researchers and policy makers, and decide what you're trying to achieve. What is your objective? So you want to raise tax, fine. But then at the same time, this was very clear when we worked with the Punjab Tax Department, it was very, very clear, the heads of the department said, we want to raise taxes, but we want to make sure that we don't create too much cost. Okay? And also, we want to have a notion of fairness. Because we're worried about overtaxation, you know, a lot of people, this is true of property tax, a lot of taxes, if you do a citizen survey and say, how much tax do you think you legally owe? It's non trivial to figure that out. You don't know your own tax liability yourself. Right. If you look at the tax, property tax is one small little tax. I hazard most of you don't know what property tax you should be paying. You pay it because someone sends a notice to you and you trust it. Well, what if that guy, often the scheme is done that your tax is like 10,000 rupees and the guy walks in and says, well, actually it's 50,000 rupees, but if you give me a little sweetening of the deal, I'll make it 10,000. And guess what? You pay the tax you actually owe, and on top of that, you pay the guy 10,000, and you ended up paying, you, you get an overtax. Right? So this is not something the department wants to encourage, which they would if you're awarded money collection. Okay? 
Um, so the first thing is decide on the objectives. The second thing is, what again Hendrick said earlier, use economic theory. Right? We, this is not a railing against what we, what, what, when we talk about these papers, which are in some sense seminal for us. Uh, Henrik mentioned earlier, these are seminal papers. These are amazing insights. Right? But at the same time, the, we have to replicate that process. Right? You have to recreate or rewrite those papers or rewrite those theoretical insights from those papers in the context that you're looking at. And in this particular case, having thought through the objectives, we came up with three schemes. Uh, these are the three schemes I mentioned. These are three different types of performance-based packages, which we introduce simultaneously to see which one does better. One only rewards on money. It's the simplest to do. It's the easiest to do. You just pay money. You collect more money, I give you money. Couldn't be simpler than that. Right? The last one is very complicated, what Wall Street does or claims it does, which is super subjective performance. I have no idea how to judge performance ex ante. At the end of the year, I will look at you, and if you do really well by a a judgment made by us, the list of bosses that you have, you will get a bonus which is three times your salary. Okay? That's a very effective, very powerful incentive mechanism, but mostly in, in, in Wall Street. The problem with that is it's very subjective, it's quite flexible, and it requires a lot of trust in the system. If you don't trust your bosses, you're not going to believe that system. But for us, theoretically, we had no idea which would work. These are all theoretically plausible mechanisms. So the answer then becomes, and this is the th third element, so first agree on the objectives, Second, think of theory and design. And the third way is, look, you have to test. A lot of progress is made in taxation and in the field by empirically testing. You have to be very, very careful in how you test. Right? And so all we did was, um, there are different ways to do rigorous evaluation. This one is randomized controlled trials, uh, which if you don't know, where have you been? Um, but if you do know, if you, but if you don't know, come afterwards in London. I'm happy to tell you all about it. Um, but, but it's very simple. It's how people figure out whether drugs work, right? You give one group uh, something and the other group nothing, and you compare it. So here are the three groups, the three schemes. What I'm showing you is a very simple way of illustrating the results of this experiment. Okay? So there's a guy who only got rewarded with money, the revenue group. The revenue plus group got money and satisfaction rewards, flexible bonus, and this, all this other funky stuff. And the comparison group is business as usual. Now what you can see is, and this is after two years of implementing this program, what happened? And the answer is pretty substantial changes. For instance, the revenue scheme, which was the most successful in collecting money, because that's what it paid on, actually had about a 46% increase in revenue collected over two years, compared to business as usual, which is 28%. Now if you want to do, and you can do this, you can do an ROI. You can say, was well, this, obviously in this scheme you had to pay people more. Was it worth it? Is this something you can get Citibank invested? And the answer is, well, if Citibank likes to get 30 to 50% a year rate of return, then yes. My guess is if you are Citibank, that's a pretty decent rate of return. Right. This is an underestimate, by the way, because what's happening is, and it's fascinating for us, is uh, we continued this for two years. The third year, for logistical reasons, we, we stopped it for a bit. But the benefits continue, because guess what happens? When you, how did these guys raise more money? They brought more people into the tax base. Once you get someone in the tax base, it's very hard to get them out of the tax base. What do you say? They say my house got destroyed, but you know, it's about there. You exist in the database. Once you exist, this is, the, this is the scare of the government. Once we know you exist, we never leave you. We're kind of like that, right? Uh, and surprisingly, very little political cost. So we measure very carefully dissatisfaction in accuracy. We find very limited evidence that. Uh, let me finish and I'll come back to you. So, so this suggested to us that, wow, these things can really work. Even though the tax farming literature historically would have said, or even though the traditional approach would have been, why are you doing this? Okay. Coming back to some of the things Robin said, um, you know, this is just one very small form. I do not, by any means, I don't think Henrik was trying to imply this either, we do not want mean to say that this incremental policy is going to sort of be the end all and be all. Right? Uh, it's that the accumulation of lots of incremental policies uh, is what can push, push the frontier. And some of these can interact with interesting ways. So for instance, uh, take Hendrick stuff, which is uh, um, third-party data reporting or, or innovations in tax reform or tax policy. My guess is, although we haven't tried this because we haven't written the paper together yet, but imagine if you have a more uh, rewarded workforce and new innovation in tax policies. Put the two together. My, my hypothesis would be that you'd be more likely to work. Because now it's in the interest of the tax staff to actually get the tax system to work better because the better it works, the more they get to work. 
Right? So the support, if you think of an innovation sense of reform, may be higher in a, in a context like this. But having said this, there's lots of other dimensions of reward in civil service. There is money, but there's also, uh, Robin alluded to this earlier, there's also, and this is a big deal for anyone who's ever been in civil service, is transfers and postings. Uh, my, my sort of heart goes out to all the civil service workers. Often when I sit in their offices, half of what I see them doing is dealing with like, there's a call, someone says, can you please place person so-and-so from position Y to position Z? And that could deal with it in some way. Right? Uh, it seems mind-numbing to me because it doesn't look like strategic thinking is happening at that point. It's just like, God, how do I deflect this pressure? It's a highly contentious thing, but it happens a lot. And so what we've been trying to do now with the same department is, is thinking about, uh, sorry, I, should, I went too far ahead, is, is, is thinking about how do we get a merit-based transfers and postings process. Uh, I won't say too much on this, because if you come to the Pakistan session, there's my chief pitch on the Pakistan session uh, right after this session. Uh, you will hear a lot about this. In, in fact, you will hear the, direct, the current Director General of Taxation also comment on this. Because a lot of the challenge in doing this, the design is not that difficult. Uh, the big challenge in doing this is, guess what happens when you start transferring people? A third of your workforce get moved around based on their performance from last year. Well, guess what's going to happen? You two things will happen. One, you'll get calls from them saying, what the hell are you doing? Why are you moving me? Secondly, you'll also get calls from other people who are saying, well, I thought it was my purvey to move people. Who the hell are you to move people? Right? They're very different pressures, but they're immense pressures. And I don't know how he's handling it, but kudos to you for handling it. Thanks uh, for doing so. But it's a challenging thing. If it works, then for us it's exciting, because now we have a comprehensive HR package. We can do pay reform and put a non-pecuniary return reform, and you put the two together, and then you can have a more comprehensive policy. I want to end with um, um, a couple of points. So one is, let's switch here. So this was all about getting your tax staff to work better. But you can't be oblivious to the fact that a lot of what tax compliance is about, and this is kind of a very interesting uh, in the literature, there's a great paper by colleagues of mine, uh, Arzo uh, Lutmar and Monica Singel, who talk a bit about kind of this idea of tax morale. Uh, the idea that you pay taxes even though the rational, selfish person, now I'm coming back to that point, in you says that you shouldn't. But you still pay. These are those Danes who aren't at 100%, they're at 50%. Why aren't they, why aren't they evading everything? Because they can get away with it. And there's a really nice, I encourage you guys to read this review paper. Erzo um, and talk a bit about different motivations. So they can be intrinsic motivations. You just, there is such a thing as it. We, we do recognize this as economists, I was joking about it. There is such a thing as intrinsic motivation. You like them. There could be social norms. Right? Uh, again, Henrik alluded to this. In Denmark, everyone else pays taxes. So when you go to a dinner party and someone says, so did you file your taxes this last week? Because I was spent all my time doing this. April 15th in the US, you remember, is a date, and we're all panicked. Or you should be all panicked. So if you don't hide yourself, try to act with the panic. Don't hide the fact that you're not paying taxes. But we all talk about this. There's a tax culture. It's time to pay taxes. There's some beautiful quotes they have in the paper about people using things like, free your country and pay taxes. There's a, there's a record around this. Um, there's also something, which is three over here, which is something we're beginning to work on again, is the idea of reciprocity. Is the idea, this is a very basic idea. This is basic political economy. The reason a state exists is so that the state can tax you and in return give you goods and services. That's the essential foundation of the state. It's called the social compact of the state. Okay. Now, it's much easier when you talk to our tax collectors, they said that often we go to a poor area and we can't collect taxes because we feel bad about collecting taxes. Because they say to us, this is property tax. Look at my street. Why should I pay you tax? And the tax collector says, actually they're right. So <coughs> how do I do that? So there has to be this idea that in all developing countries, we need to figure out how to, if you will, build tax morale. Well, this is really hard. We don't understand this. This is a very soft object for us. Right? Now, there is some great work that is happening. Again, uh, to put a pitch, um, Mushfiq, who I previously made fun of, and now I'll, uh, in fact, um, the gentleman over here. Um, there is a great project in Bangladesh where they're trying to look at whether you can do social incentives to get people to pay. And people in this case are firms. So uh, you're going to present this tomorrow morning, right? So tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., 
the state state capability session. Uh, if you want to hear more about that, it's a, it's, a, it's a great, powerful way of saying can social mobilization. Uh, we're trying to do stuff uh, with um, uh, with property tax again, which is linking the citizens' risk perceived benefits. Now, property tax is the easiest to do this because in te technically, property tax is a local tax. I mean, you asked a question earlier about municipal taxes. Uh, if there's one tax where, in theory, you should see the benefit, it's property tax. And that's why people move to neighborhoods in the U.S. They say, oh, higher property tax, but good public schools or better garbage collection. Right? So we're trying to see if we can, can make that, in, in theory, in all countries, property tax often is local. But people don't believe it. They don't believe that X percent, what is legally mandated to be spent in my community, is spent in my community. So there's a deeper question of, if you want to get tax compliance, you have to rebuild that faith that people have in the system. And how do you do that when the faith is collapsing? Well, you could try and have faith in the macro system, but that's really hard. Maybe small, start very small and rebuild people's faith in how I pay, my garbage gets collected, and my street is a bit cleaner. And from that, you can then do things like democracy and all that other fun stuff. Um, OK, let me just end. What were we trying to say over here in this session? Then we open up for, for, for discussion on this. Uh, we were trying to say first, um, now again, we, we're trying to be a bit provocative over here, so it's not that personally when you ask us, when you get us a bit happy in the evenings, whether we'd agree with this, but, but, but we kind of, a lot of the research that we're doing, not just Henry and I, but a lot of the colleagues sitting over here, actually in this room, one of the belief we have is that simply transplanting solutions, whether it be in tax or something else, isn't enough. Um, instead, we should take, we gave you one approach, but a really hands-on approach, an approach where you, you work together uh, with your counterparts, with your policy counterparts, uh, to try and come up with better solutions. And, and this is more challenging. I want to acknowledge that. This is harder to do. It's harder for us. It's harder for you guys. It's more challenging because first of all, it does require data. It so happens in taxation, the beauty is, or in finance, we have the data. Often it's, in, it's not necessarily digitized, but it's there. You can digitize it, right? So first of all, it does require data. Second, it does require design. You have to go back to the foundations. You have to go back to the basics and build design, OK? That's, and you saw examples of this both in the work that I talked about and the work Henrik talked about. Um, it also requires an evaluation process. Theoretically, you could have a great idea, but unless you empirically validate and test it, you don't know for sure. So it has to have an evaluation component built into it. Okay? And finally, this, I keep saying this, but I can't underestimate this, it requires a deep collaboration and support between policymakers and researchers. It just simply cannot happen without. Uh, and that's sometimes uh, forthcoming, sometimes it's not. For uh, either the researchers don't quite get it, or the policymakers aren't as interested. Uh, but I'm hoping that kind of the, the, the goal of not just the session, but the whole IGC's frequent meets is to encourage matchmaking like this. You're in here in the audience, you have researchers sitting next to you, literally next to you, in fact, you're interspersed between policymakers and researchers, that these side conversations get fostered. Right? Someone makes a comment and you say, actually, I like that idea. I'm suffering with this problem. Can you come and think about it? Can we brainstorm about it? So I'd encourage you in your breakout sessions and dinners, uh, don't go talk to your fellow researcher or fellow policymaker, as tempting as that might be. Talk to someone from a different community about something that you can, you can gain from each other. Uh, we personally benefit a lot from it. So it is doable, for sure. This kind of it's hard, but it's doable. Uh, we gave a few examples today, uh, and I'm hoping we'll see many more in the years to come. Thank you.
Actually, the basis was that PAT registration bills on the image of the farm. And secondly, display of the names of the company, VAT players, on dashboards and giving them social recognition in terms of gold or silver cars, something like that. And that worked in our country while I work well there as the national border region. So we have to go in a different way. So basically, uh, there are a lot of thoughts uh, in the papers. And uh, uh, as a policymaker, um, I I had much to uh, talk, but I will little bit because he has covered, especially Professor Sasim uh, covered a lot of things uh, uh, regarding HR policy for tax officials. This is very, very, uh, I think, uh, your recommendation <coughs> from the but that alone will not do. Let's, we should have a holistic view. At the end of the tax is a political decision making, because I want the finance minister, always the, the and the taxation, and there is a committee, a parliament standing on taxation. They are all big uh, business people, they are magnates of society. So there are a lot of conflicts of interest. So the, uh, the big taxpayers, the finance minister, the members of the parliament. So how uh, these uh, things, the incentive system, pecuniary, non pecuniary, that is important. Because when any officer of my department, is to detect any and uh, any tax evasion and collect it the same. We immediately <coughs> try to reward this ten percent or five percent what what he or she collected, uh, recovered. Actually, that was the foregone money. But uh, whether that will work in the long run to achieve the target, that's a very difficult. It was really difficult with uh, uh, to uh, achieve the target. We, yeah, so basically, the what is the important political conflict is very important and how we can ensure that. At least we have to look. Uh, there are many things uh, we, they have covered. But the organizational development, that is how we can ensure the autonomy or the financial or the functional autonomy of the taxation department. That it is there. The National Border Region in Bangladesh that was created by the Act of the Parliament. But we wanted that in the act, it should be there, that there should be no interference in the operational uh, work of the, uh, of the officers, the collection of the taxes. <coughs> Design of the taxes, it, it will be done, the tax policy will be done by the parliament. But regarding the collection of uh, taxes, the, your, uh, the enforcement, it is difficult. <coughs> the, the officers are given the power. And secondly, the accountability of the tax officials is also very important. Because in a country like Bangladesh or other countries, many countries, there are a lot of problems of accountability, the rent seeking. You talked about low corruption. But no, it is, uh, I, 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 in my country, it's very high among the tax department, both the income tax and value added tax. So, how we can make these people accountable to the people? Uh, to the, so, that is also has to be um, in the form of law. And uh, finally, uh, there are many things uh, uh, about, so these things, I think, and regarding the tax enforcement, uh, I think there was, you talked about audit uh, penalty. But what I would be, if we found in many cases that people went to the court, to, uh, even we, we tried to collect tax, uh, we uh, did some audit work, found that a particular farm, a person evaded taxes. But when we gave some notice, we tried to collect, immediately he or she went to the court and got the stay order from the court. So actually, and that's why we thought in a different way how uh, to address the problem. And the South Asia had a very, South Africa had a very example of alternative dispute resolution, India. So we have to think in terms of how the legal reforms can help. So not only the existing law, and I mean, they 80 per, more than 80 percent litigations relating to taxation are solved out of the court in South Africa. So we try to follow that. And another thing we did since 2010 for the tax fair, which is unique, I think, uh, in the uh, world. In Bali. So. Instead of co people coming to tax office for TIN, 
or uh, the form, the filing of tax returns, payment of taxes. We, we have, we, we, we hold fair, tax fair, where there were children's corner, <coughs> one stop service, everything was there. So when it was uh, in the park, um, uh, not in the office, open space. So uh, and, uh, that is a lot of interest. It is going now, this time. So we will collect a lot of taxes. So we have to think that way, out of the uh, traditional way of collecting taxes. How tax people can go to the people and motivational. Not the enforcement is the last resort. But what is more important is the motivational campaign, outreach, education, because we try to do something. And, uh, and people respond importantly. If you can approach people, make the system comfortable for the people, like the automation and business process re-engineering, definitely um, during my tenure, about four years, as the chairman of the National Road Engine, I found, I found people are responding positively. So I think if we are given the environment of autonomy <coughs> and, and we can work uh, the uh, freedom, uh, in, uh, freely and also there are some legal changes to so the needs of the customers, the taxpayers, <coughs> uh, we, we can achieve the, uh, our target of uh, revenue mobilization. And at the same time, we can also facilitate trade, business, and other things. Thank you very much. The floor is open. Awesome. I really like your approach. I think it really applies and should apply to the Federal Bureau of Revenue. <laughs> uh, the big the, fish. Uh, the big fish. The reason why I say that is that for the property tax, at least in Pakistan, it's at the wrong level. Uh, you know, putting a property tax in the Punjab, which is a province of 100 million people, you don't have the political economy constraint, which is linking the property tax to local service delivery. I think really, you really need to cut the Gordian knot with the property tax in Pakistan. Uh, actually, you need to cut the Gordian knot with every tax. <laughs> All the assignments are screwed up, which really makes it impossible to, for example, use the value added tax generate the information that Henry was talking about. And the information generated by the value added tax on the value chain is essentially what you need uh, more than the third party information, which you can use, and indeed the trial to use the third party information in order to quite work. Because you really need to have the information on the actual value added to be able to link it to the to, to the income tax. Just a, another one one last point on Chile. Uh, Chile collects uh, just over 11% of GDP in its VAT, which is somewhat better than other uh, the administered countries like Norway, France, Germany, and the UK. <laughs> yes. uh, I agree with John. Uh, in fact, I'd love if you could point me to the right people in FBR. Uh, we, we have one, I think one, one is right there. But, but, I, think but I think a point has to be made by RGC. Uh, not only are you talking about the tax administration reforms, and I think you're, you're hitting exactly the right points, but these points are relevant to the discussion of the major tax that I did. I I know you're I'm from SRB, but I can help you. <laughs> I'm sure you're, you're, you're helping friends today. Yes. <laughs> So I have a question on how you're in the paper on tax farming, you're calculating some return on investment, and I'm not sure of, of the figures, but it seems like you're just thinking at, of the objective function as maximizing revenue, and you said that it's subject to something, but in public finance, a point that is made a lot is that you're collecting more taxes, so there's more debt with loss, yes. more in business case, so I was wondering if... We can do this all the time, but the answer is yes, we're thinking about it. But it's a fair Let's do this all Yes. I wanted to uh, note when you mentioned uh, tax culture, that uh, why are we ignoring uh, uh, the thing that there is something like a social conscience, and people do uh, report, at least in India, uh, on a neighbor who's not paid, uh, who they think is not paying enough taxes. In Pakistan, when I came and asked people that would you sort of tell the government that uh, your neighbor or your friend or your brother-in-law is not paying taxes, they said never. Never. So the question of tax culture also is very important, and I think uh, Dr. Emma uh, has pointed out that 
they are also looking at these things that you know how to educate people in this. So we should also do that in Pakistan. Why should we not tell the government that uh, A Y A B C is not doing that? So, uh, maybe Henry goes with I know in Pakistan there actually was an effort um, this time in the elections, before the elections, the FBR and actually the state bank released data on both tax payments and on loans and default on loans. Yeah, but then the uh, election commission chose to ignore them. Th that's true. <coughs> but the, the public data, saw them. The data is available and anybody who wants to look at the data and so it's but I think I don't know Henrik what's your sense on kind of the social how powerful are these social peer pressures? Well, I, I think we, we, we don't know uh, that much about it yet. It's an interesting uh, research agenda. I'm sure he's going to talk about some, you know, I've done a little bit of work recently, but not in a, in a developing country concept. We're just beginning to, to do that. I, I, so, so I think that's an, that's an interesting incremental approach. In, in terms of the big picture, how do we turn uh, the boundless death system into a Scandinavian style tax system? In terms of that really long run, I would be very surprised that social incentives can okay. can do that alone. I think that long run is about that is about information as there's one information that was fully and completely successful tax systems, but but that's kind of not what we know. I think it's it's an interesting, promising uh, avenue for climate change. I guess I was just gonna make for some of them here, which is in developing countries so the third part of reporting, not clear it's going to work as well as it works in Denmark also, right? So that, Absolutely yeah. Right, so that's the it's not automatic you can play yeah. when you have the system. So that's why I say I think that the marginal and the global effects might be very different. Can we just can we this yes? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I like this nitty gritty micro approach idea. I and mean, it's got a lot in common, it seems, with the problem driven iterative adaptation from Matt Andrews at Harvard. I don't know if you heard about this, but I think the thing with that, that Matt Andrews approach adds to this a little bit is about starting with a problem. I think anyone who's worked as a civil servant knows that the most important thing is that it has to be politically salient to begin with. The politicians have to be motivated to want to solve the problem as well as just the, the policy makers. Policy makers are very interested in the technical issues and what's interesting, how can we improve the situation, but it has to have some political salience. Well. Uh, I couldn't agree. So, uh, obviously, I don't like extremely well in my favor, so uh, it always works. And I couldn't agree more. In fact, I should have acknowledged, actually, even in this, every single thing we did, required the political leadership, the chief minister in this case. We have how many summaries by now? Huh? Seven. Seven. Seven different distinct pieces where the chief minister signs and says, I'm going to this. Without that, it's not going to So there is a, we don't have politicians in the room, so I wasn't. People are sitting in the school are sitting because the chief minister has signed it. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> <laughs> Just to follow up on the, on the question of culture, I think the focus in part two is on culture about uh, social con social contracts and social pressure to pay taxes. I think something that the Danish case shows is we also need to think in the reverse, which is modern tax systems in which the cultural norm is that you pay not a penny more than you're legally absolutely bound to pay, <laughs> upon which the entire profession of tax accountants and lawyers is built. So Danes and the Apples and the Amazons of this world may be subject to a, actually a cultural norm which makes it look like they don't give a damn, but in fact, what is good is to pay no more than your account tells you. Yeah, so that that's uh, so so that was consistent with, with some recent work we did in Germany on on social incentives and and Julia. What we saw there is that in a particular tax system in Germany, which is actually unenforced, but it's within the German context where most people pay taxes. There was a lot of sort of socially and intrinsically driven demand that sent a lot of people pay their taxes even though they could completely get away with not doing it. And most people paid exactly what the law told them, not one penny more, not one penny less. <coughs> That's consistent. I think we have time for one more. I was just curious, so I heard that there was a lot of people who were paying taxes, and there was a lot of people who were paying taxes, and there was a lot of people who were paying taxes, and there was a lot of people who were paying taxes, and there was a lot of people who were paying taxes, and there was a lot of people who were paying taxes, and there was a lot of people um, did you also ask the people who were already paying, how did they see this invention? Or, and yeah. So it's very interesting, I mean, it's a longer discussion, but what we find is that, so there's a nuance to the effect that there are some people who end up paying a lot more. Um, we thought they'd be really upset. Um, turns out when we ask them rankings about the department, they actually update more positively in the department. Uh, which, I guess the department, so th there's a deeper question, which is, when do you start annoying people at which point? And I don't know the answer to that, which is I think there's an expectation of what's fair and not fair. My own read is you were getting a deal before, 
which you shouldn't have really been getting, and now you don't get the deals, it doesn't upset you as much as you thought it would. But that's a conjecture. Uh, but, but these measures are going to be much more subjective than like, money. I think we've come to the end of the discussion. Thank you very much for all the presenters. One housekeeping uh, announcement. The Tanzanian session will now take place in room 1.49. So there's been a change.
that's not true. I should correct that. I agree. But that's no. No, but if you say the top five percent are underpaid, then you make your friends here anyway. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Like you're because they're these guys are all from the top five percent. So when I'm the ace, I can't do that. <laughs> 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 and then I get top rating to follow them. Well, see, you guys are all so so no, is the only country I know which they as a top guy is really worth. See, it just reflects our bias that we only think about the top five percent. Those guys are underpaid. Okay, that's our demographic. Anyway, see you tomorrow. Yeah, I'm ready tomorrow. Sometimes some countries you see these spikes here and there.